you know, even today where I am teaching Christian yoga, you know, I, I hear a lot of pushback from both sides. The traditional yoga community says you can't do Christian yoga. You're changing the whole tradition of what it was and what it was intended for. And then we have Christians who say you can't practice Christian yoga. It's really Hinduism. It's really Buddhism. There's no way you can infuse it to. But I say, but God, what man intended for evil, God can use for good. All things are possible through him. He has shown me. He has shown me a way prayerfully. I, this was not my way. This was not my intention. I asked. I sought. I prayed. I wanted the Lord to show me how can I infuse, um, how can I take this practice that is traditional and bring it to a level where we can glorify God? That's my purpose is to glorify God, speak truth and share the gospel from the mat. God made a way. It is possible. You just heard a portion of the fascinating conversation I had with our guest today, who's a Christian yoga instructor. And maybe you've always wondered, are those worlds even compatible? Maybe you've had trouble figuring out whether meditation or mindfulness or the practice of yoga was something that could benefit you, but you thought this was something that just wouldn't work in your Christian lifestyle. Well, our guest today is going to explain how she used the benefits of yoga to help her find God and to find an even deeper connection with her faith, her creative calling, and everything that she had to offer the world. You're going to find so much inspiration and some new revelations in this interview. Let's get into it. Artists, musicians, and creatives of all kinds. Looking for help balancing your passion to create with your everyday life? Not sure if your faith can coexist with your profession? Welcome to a place where real artists discuss real life. You're listening to The God and Gig Show. Visit GodandGigs.com for show notes, links, and more information. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for listening. This is episode 89 of the God and Gig Show, and I am your host, Alan C. Paul. And if you're new to the show, I'm an author, creative coach, and musician who just helps people to build better creative lives from the inside out through this God and Gigs community. And I think you're in the right place because you're probably a musician, an author, a speaker, a poet. You're probably someone in the art and entertainment field, which is a vast field, of course, so it can cover so many areas of the creative life. But we always try to bring it back to faith, career, and relationships and how we can help you build a better creative life from the inside out. And if you've been listening to the show, thanks so much for sticking with us. And I hope by now you've either subscribed to the show or probably in addition to that, review the show and let us know what you think and let us know what you are learning and uh, what's impacting you the most from these episodes, because it really is a joy to connect with creatives just like you every week. Speaking of connecting with creatives, today's interview is a fascinating talk with someone who, as far as her expertise, I never would have thought I'd be connecting with. But as you'll find, we have so much in common and this person is going to help you, especially in your walk as far as a Christian, a creative, and navigating that balance between what you do, what you're passionate about, and your principles and your Christian faith. We're talking about Miranda Jo Davis as far as our guest today. She's an expert in the field of health and wellness. She is a Christian yoga instructor, as well as a biblical counselor, freelance writer, author, and speaker. And she has written a book called Christian Girl in a Yoga World. So right away when I saw that, I realized that she's going to really connect with our God and Gigs community because she too has had to navigate between something she's passionate about, but something that does not always honor her Christian beliefs. So today you're going to learn from this interview how her experience as a professional dancer led her to some medical and mental struggles and yoga provided an antidote to that perfectionism and that busyness that she was feeling. She's going to talk about how she handled the conflicts between yoga's roots and the principles of Christianity and how she dealt with backlash from both Christians who disagreed with the practice and the traditional yoga instructors she had to learn from who thought she was undermining the practice. We got into a deep conversation about meditation and mindfulness and stillness and how these are spiritual Christian principles that we can apply to our everyday lives as Christian creatives. That really impacted me a lot. You're going to love everything she has to share about balance, 
about finding the ways that these practices of stillness, learning to say no, learning to uh, properly apply self-care in your life are going to bring massive benefits to your quality of life, both in your career and your personal life. So I'm so looking forward to sharing this with you. Let's get right into this conversation with coach, author, and Christian yoga instructor, Miranda Joe Davis. Hello, Miranda. How are you? I'm great, Alan. Thank you so much for having me on your show. I hope that I can share some wisdom and in- insight with some of your listeners today. Well, I hope so too. And uh, I'm not, I'm very transparent on this show. So we had some technical difficulties right before we started. So if you hear <laughs> us kind of say, oh, I know that uh, it's because we've been talking for the last 15 minutes and, and kind of got to know each other even a little more than maybe we would have if we had first started this interview just right off the bat. So I do want to ask you once again to give your uh, background just for the listener that's listening to you for the first time. Uh, they may be saying, wait a minute, why is a yoga instructor, why is someone that practices yoga even on, even though they should understand the God of Gig show is all about <laughs> connecting faith and practical uh, applications and creativity, but can you just tell them like what you do and how you serve people? Absolutely. Yes. So I am a Christian yoga instructor for the last 11 years. I, I specifically have connected my faith to the practice, but I've been teaching a traditionally based yoga for over 21 years, traveled the world as a global trainer, Uh, but I originated in that world out of being a professional dancer and choreography. And um, we didn't share this, Alan, I actually was, uh, hip hop was my thing. So, um, which might be surprising, (laughs) but uh, I love, love, love dancing. And, uh, And that passion transpired really easily right over into the world of yoga. And I love that because even as we were talking, we were talking about how dance and perfectionism in that world, whether it be hip hop, ballet, anything. I'm a musician, as you know, I have uh, I cannot dance to save my life. I'm one of those people that feel too many beats. I, I hear all the beats and I want to dance to all the beats. It's like, no, you're not supposed to dance to every note. <laughs> so clearly my wife and my daughter would be happy to know that I'm never going to enter that world. But I do respect it. I've obviously played and performed in so many applications where dances, I mean, dance and music are are literally, I think, synonymous. Like you cannot, you know, the whole purpose for music, honestly, both in church and outside is, is to move, is to feel, is to express through movement and through, and through the body. So can you just talk about, number one, one of the things that I've, you know, read in your, uh, and as I was researching, you were very uh, high level dancer. You were professional. You were thinking about going into professional dancing. And then something happened where you needed to step away or where there was some situations where it led you into yoga. Can you talk about number one, the pressure of dance and then number two, how it led you into your next season? Yes. You know, I, I did dance professionally and I call myself a jack of all trades dancer. Actually outside of hip hop, I could do tap jazz ballet very well. Modern dancing also was part of my uh, college with, with my degree. Um, but that world was so fun. I loved it, but it was, um, you know, everyday dancing um, and it took a toll on my body. I, I call myself a recovering perfectionist because I believe that the world of dance requires perfection. I believe that if you want to be able to take um, your talents to the highest level, then you need to be uh, really dedicated to the craft. And so uh, as a result of that, I suffered from IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, and would have bouts of either nausea and diarrhea or vomiting, sometimes both, but that usually happened around competitions and around shows. Um, and so, you know, I had luckily a woman who was a fellow dancer who, um, you know, I was telling her how sick I was, and she said, you know, she practiced yoga, and she said, I think that you would really benefit um, from learning how to relax a little bit and slow down. The world of dance is not relaxing, um, but that's okay. It's, it's just, that's just a part of it. And I was really leery. This was 1999 and yoga studios were not on every corner like they are today. I, I really visualized myself sitting there with my fingers touching and, and chanting some strange words. And I was, you know, I was in my early twenties. I was like, I'm not going to do that, but I did give it a chance and I fell in love with my first class. Now, you said, by the way, number one, you found that that this woman introduced you to yoga, but I also remember reading and hearing you say earlier that you were not a Christian at this time. So how did those two worlds parallel uh, in terms of you finding both this this new way of uh, finding mental health and spirit and a way to, you know, achieve better physical health, obviously, in terms of your body and your and your and your ailments, but then also your spirit and learning what 
well, what, uh, what was possibly, I guess we would find out later, was a compatible thing between yoga and Christianity. How did you find those, those two worlds at that same time? Yeah, so first I'll address, you know, that um, I, I was hungry. I was spiritually hungry. I, I didn't know that word or that term, but I was looking for something. Dance was fulfilling, but it did not fulfill me in a way that um, what I came to know later as a Christian was, was what I needed from the Lord. I needed that from Jesus and from God. Um, so I was seeking. And so at that time when I was battling the IBS, um, went to the yoga class first and fell in love with that. And I did share, you know, mentally, I could not relax. I could identify with all the movement, loved how that flowed like a dance class. It really was like poetry in motion to me. Felt like I was home. But at the end, when she asked us to relax, I was like, what is she talking about? Why are we breathing? Why are we laying here? Um, but that didn't quite do it either. And so it was really that I started getting these mailers to attend a church. I was a newlywed and my husband and I were having conflicts in our marriage, um, just being real upfront. And this was a marriage conference. And we got those mailers one season in the spring. And I asked my husband to go and he said no. Got the same mailer a whole year later. And I, I, I don't know what it was. I feel like it was God, even though I didn't know God at the time. I opened the mailbox, saw the mailer, and I said to myself, I'm going to this same marriage conference. And I told my husband, I said, I really want you to go. I'm going with this. We're, you know, we're in trouble. Um, and you know, went just like, just like the yoga class went to this church, which I did not know was an outreach church, saving people like me who did not know the Lord. They were playing Beatles songs and I love Beatles. They were playing all you need is love. There were not Bibles in the pews, um, because they were looking for people like me who maybe would be turned off by a traditional church. Um, but I fell in love with it and that's how I came to know the Lord. And that was really what gave me the fulfillment that I was looking for, that yoga could not provide and dance could not provide. Wow. See, now that you just opened up a whole nother part that I, I would, we could be talking about two hours about this because <laughs> here's the thing that I, I always say when it comes to these conversations and when it comes to the creative life, what we really are doing is a microcosm of both the Christian life and human experience in terms of living in this creative world, whether it be dance or yoga or music. And then especially in ministry, we're just living out life and noticing how God intercedes in these areas. And for you, for your, your, your faith journey to intercede in a way where you got into a church was obviously it was seeker friendly that they were, they were using secular music. Well, we, again, I use the quotes unquote secular music because I believe God owns all good things. Right. Mm -hmm. So God, you know, you know, the devil doesn't own 12 notes and the devil doesn't own a certain beat. Uh, and so I love the fact that now you're saying you're showing how uh, this, this uh, artificial divide between uh, sacred and secular sometimes. I'm not saying all things, obviously. There is, there's definitely a place for holiness and being separate and being understanding of what is Christian and what is not. But I love the fact that it seems like, it seems like a theme in your life. Is that safe to say a theme that something that was considered not Christian was able to lead you into something where you actually found God and found, uh, some, 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 found a balance there? Is that, is, that, is that safe to say? Oh, I love that. Yes. You know, I've never really thought of it in that terms, but yes, absolutely. That, you know, even today where I am teaching Christian yoga, you know, I, I hear a lot of pushback from both sides. The traditional yoga community says you can't do Christian yoga. You're changing the whole tradition of what it was and what it was intended for. And then we have Christians who say you can't practice Christian yoga. It's really Hinduism. It's really Buddhism. There's no way you can infuse it to. But I say, but God. Right. What man intended for evil, God can use for good. All things are possible through him. He has shown me. He has shown me a way prayerfully. I, this was not my way. This was not my intention. I asked. I sought. I prayed. I wanted the Lord to show me. How can I infuse? Um, how can I take this practice that is traditional and bring it to a level where we can glorify God? That's my purpose is to glorify God, speak truth and share the gospel from the mat. God made a way. It is possible. Amen to that. See, again, now you're preaching to the people who, again, who I need and want to hear this kind of message because so many of us, again, I'm just kind of casting the net wide because, you know, again, I speak from music, but obviously we have so many creators, freelance writers, movie makers, actresses, actors, poets, and they all might be feeling that same tension you're feeling. So I kind of want you to go there because that's obviously what your book is about, like literally titled Christian Girl in a Yoga World. Mm 
So I want you to kind of talk about how do you handle, number one, obviously as a practitioner and someone who teaches this, I, I, I did, again, I, I know nothing of the practice, but I love how you explained in some of your uh, discussions, you, you, you infuse the, the scripture, like you actually, uh, and like you said, with some people that may be pushing back, you, you don't just take, you know, one part of the practice and say, oh, we're going to add a little Bible verse here. Like you've infused Christianity into the entire, uh, you call yourself a Christian yoga instructor. So when people come to you, they're joining a Christian yoga class. They know that, right? It's not just yoga with a little bit of faith. Like they know what you're about. That's yes, that's there's absolutely. I'm going to tell a little bit about uh, my, my community because I do, I would think of it just like when I went to that church for the first time, not knowing what to expect, but I got in there and I thought, okay, I, this is, I can do this. They're playing some Beatles music and you know, there's not any Bibles, but they're, they're talking God and they're talking scripture and they're talking to me specifically that I'm, I'm a lost soul. I'm a lost soul. And I, I identified with that. There was something from me that was missing. So I do have people that come to my class. It's important to know, Alan, that are of the Muslim faith, that are uh, that, that do not have any sort of religious views or values. But then I have very strong Christians. So I do not ever uh, water down God's word. I share the scriptures as they are, as the truth and what they when, and how God would intend them to be spoken about. Um, I pray for people. Uh, I, I share the gospel from the mat. Um, I, I also lead other Christian uh, yoga instructors how to teach a specific style of yoga. But I want everyone to feel welcome. I would never want to, to feel like you have to be a Christian to come to my class or you have to believe everything I believe to come to my class. So it's again, it's it's a I feel like God has given me a huge ministry from the mat that where I can reach a lot of people in a way that maybe a church wouldn't, maybe they wouldn't go to the church, but maybe they would come and take from this Christian yoga instructor. So that's really the way I approach it. Um, I, I am very adamant that uh, as a biblical counselor, I do not want to ever twist God's word to make it conform to this yoga practice. I want to um, speak what is true uh, of him, true, noble, excellent, praiseworthy, as Philippians 4, 8 says. Uh, meditate and think on those things. Teach of those things. That's really my philosophy. I love it. And I wanted to kind of go right to what you just said about meditation. And again, some of the things where you get pushback from Christians and other people in the faith space. And uh, I, I will speak for myself again. I always kind of put myself as the, uh, you know, on, on the hot seat as the person to be the example. Uh, I have been uh, diagnosed with ADD. Uh, I have taken medication before for that, for anxiety and depression. I uh, I have was actually just a couple of uh, years ago. I'm so glad you brought up your marriage and how that stress also led you to, you know, looking for solutions that eventually led you to Christ. Um, in my marriage, um, you know, I went through a stage where I was going to therapy. We were both going to therapy. And my therapist at the time uh, suggested mindfulness. And I, as a biblical scholar, a Bible guy, was like, oh, no, I don't want to empty my mind. I don't want to listen to this music playing this Zen-like thing and go to, you know. But some of the practices and some of the meditation techniques he taught me really helped but i had to throw in again that reminder don't try to empty my mind don't try to just go blank but let god speak to me whatever's in will come out right out of my belly will flow liver, rivers of living water and that was my picture instead of thinking of just nothingness i tried to think of god's spirit flowing through me and that really helped so can you speak again i just put myself out there just so people who may think meditation is crazy. No, you're talking to someone that had to learn how to balance meditation with God's word. So can you talk about the importance of that, about how you teach people to still their mind, but do so in a Christian way? Yes. And so I love you just said the word stillness. So Psalm 4610 says to be still and know that I'm God. For myself, just the way my brain works, stillness is the last thing that I would choose to do in my day. Um, but it's been, it's a practice. It's a spiritual discipline. That's the way I try to explain it to people like that you would want to exercise or you want to eat well, or, you know, if you are a musician that you're going to practice your craft or a dancer, you're going to get out there and, and practice dancing. Um, it's practicing learning how to quiet the mind in a way that's God honoring, which again is for, for me, I don't really relate to the traditional way of meditation, which is to empty the mind. That is just one form that that is do I want to explain to people there are it's like genres of music. There's many, many ways that you can meditate um, in the traditional sense. 
Um, so emptying the mind is quite hard. I really believe in filling our mind, as the scriptures say, with things that are you know, excellent, true, noble, praiseworthy. So perhaps that means that you go sit outside for five minutes. This isn't something that, I mean, it's important to know. People get anxious about time. How long am I supposed to sit here and do this quiet time? You know, it doesn't have to be anything grand. Five minutes, go outside, take deep breaths, observe what you see in nature. Look at the leaves. Notice the sun on your skin, you know, let the breeze blow on your body. That's really kind of what I think mindfulness is taken from. But it's really if we put the aspect on who Christ is, he wants us to observe his creation. He wants us to be in his creation. That's just one of a gazillion ways. You know, you could use scripture. I love, um, for example, like let's say if we did, we took a scripture and we said, all things are possible in Christ. You could inhale and just say to yourself, inhaling all things, exhaling are possible in Christ. And you could just make that, it's called a breath prayer. Breathing in scripture, breathing out scripture, letting your mind fill with those things. So those are just a couple of ways. But when you do that, your central nervous system calms down. It ceases the flight or flight, the fight or flight response, which so many of us are in because our world t- tells us do more, be more, stay busy. And, and that is not a, that is of the world. It's not of what biblical values and, and how God chooses and calls us to live. I love that. And I love the fact that you pointed out um, the breathing and both in terms of the, the natural way that we react and move as human beings. Obviously, God breathed into us the breath of life, right? We are literally living and breathing because God gives us the ability to do so. And then nature, which is also the, the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Like everything he creates um, is is a sign and a testament of him. And so, like you said, I had to learn very, very soon that taking a walk for five minutes or actually what I've done, my practice is now, uh, thanks to a book by Bob Sorge, it's, uh, he, t- he talked about resetting your prayer life. And he mm-hmm. talks about taking the best part of your day and giving it back to God for your meditation or your, or your devotion, right? I can kind of interchangeably use those. And mine is now 20 minutes of going, I literally did this right before we got on this uh, call, 20 minutes outside looking at my canal and then the river behind my house and just you know, being able to read my Bible and pray and think, but then sometimes just looking at the sparrow and seeing that sparrow brings back that scripture to mind or seeing the tree by the river brings back Psalm one. And it just, it, it demystified it. Am I making sense as I was talking about myself? I know, but hopefully someone's hearing me and thinking the same thing that, Oh, it's not as mystical as we seem to make meditation out to be. Oh yes. That makes absolutely That makes great, perfect sense. I'm actually, you know, I lead a lot of Christian meditation because I believe the scriptures are full of truth that we can focus on. But as you said, like as far as, you know, our creator and the creation, uh, you know, you can talk about how he says, you know, how the scriptures talk about us being firmly planted by the waters, you know, that whatever we do will prosper. We will not wither when he comes. You know, you could just meditate, focus on yourself, just sitting rooted and God grounded in God's word and knowing that what you're going to do has a purpose and a plan and it's prosperous because that's the way God ordained our thoughts to articulate. Um, you know, I had a, I did not recognize before I started yoga and before I became a Christian, how habitual the negative thoughts were in my mind. Mm. So it was, I had to retrain. And the first way I did that was with praise and thanksgiving. You know, uh, I have, I believe in mentorship. I believe in working side by side with another person. I've done that for 15 years. I now mentor people, but the first mentor, she was like, you need to make a list every day of 10 things that you can thank God for. And I, that sounds easy, but that was a challenge. I mean, I was like, I mean, I did not recognize that that was hard, but you know, First Thessalonians 5, 18, give thanks in all circumstances, not when times are bad and not when times are just good, but when times are challenging, tough as well, all circumstances. So that's become a big part of how I choose to mentor people today is looking through the lens of gratitude and thanksgiving, because I mean, that's God ordained. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And thank you so much for once again, bringing up. And of course, right whenever I'm talking, somebody comes to the door. But anyway... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> this has been such an interesting conversation because of all the things that tried to stop us and we pushed through. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful to God for that. Um, I wanted to re- quickly go to, you're talking about a lot of the stillness, meditation, and I'm talking and we are talking to creatives who uh, I guess would say worship the hustle sometimes. We are, we are kind of, we kind of alluded to this, but I want to directly say 
to other creatives like us. I know you probably have a million things going on. As a matter of fact, I remember seeing one of your Instagram posts as I was scrolling where you were writing your book and you were talking about how you were in the middle of, I don't know if it was parenting or something like <laughs> there were 500 things going around and you had the picture and you said, in the middle of this, I'm creating this. And of course, that was, I think that's when the pandemic was getting ready to hit. So <laughs> can you speak to just the creatives in terms of how you've managed so many different parts of both your business, your creative and your personal life, like how those things come together and how you've been able to like, you know, basically you, you've launched this thing, I think, right in the last few months or weeks or months or uh, the last year or so. You're, you're doing a lot. How, how are you balancing it all out as a creative? We'll get back to our talk with Miranda in just a moment, but I wanted to tell you there's already a resource available to help you balance the world between your creative life and your spiritual life. We created a free devotional called Your Creative Jumpstart, which can help you to restart the connection between your spiritual life, what you do creatively every day, and give you some thinking points, some biblical applications that you can apply to every day of your life, but starting with just a week devotional. It's a easy way to use that devotional time each day to connect it with what you're doing and to set an intention that will really bless you throughout your creative life. It's easy to get and it's free. All you have to do is tap the link in our show notes or go to godandgigs.com slash jumpstart. Godandgigs.com slash jumpstart. It's seven days. It's free. It's a simple PDF to pick up and then make your notes in and take out with your Bible for your devotional time. And I cannot recommend this enough for all of you who are considering how you can strengthen the link between your calling, your purpose, and your God-given identity as an artist and creative. Now let's get back to our great discussion with Miranda. Can you speak to just the creatives in terms of how you've managed so many different parts of both your business, your creative and your personal life, like how those things come together and how you've been able to like, you know, basically you've launched this thing, I think, right in the last few months or weeks or months or uh, the last year or so, you're, you're doing a lot. How, how are you balancing it all out as a creative? Yeah, you know, because as a creative, I have so many ideas, right? <laughs> they come to me all the time. And so I've had to really learn to decipher what is what is just an idea that I have that may be a good idea. And, and how can I, you know, meditation, I use that to meditate and I pray and I want to decipher what is my idea versus what is God calling me to do. Um, I can get off. I, I had to train myself again. It's a discipline to me. I can get off the path and start to get off on, into something that looks like a great idea, but it's really being disciplined on what I feel like is a purpose and a plan. And so in the pandemic, yes, I was homeschooling kids. I was writing a book. Uh, I launched the book in May of, of this year, 2020. And, um, you know, I just stayed purposeful. I have to really, for me, I'm most creative in the morning. So I get up at 4 a.m. Um, and I do a lot of work before I probably do more work sometimes I think before most people um, you know ever get up and then they're getting started with their day and I've completed like a day's worth of work so um, that's just kind of I think knowing how your creativity can work for you and then knowing how it can work against you is really important oh now I kind of want to dig into you just that last part you put how it can work against you because I think um, I remember again listening to one of your conversations about how uh, creativity and I just say yoga. I remember you saying this phrase. I don't know where I saw it, but you said where you can fall in love with something, but then falling in love with it can also be a bad thing where you fall too much in love with it. And I believe you were talking about in terms of yoga, how people like love yoga. They love going or they love this. is They think that they, you know, they find so much solace and so much uh, peace in but then I guess you, in a sense, you, it, it can become an idol. So can awesome. you talk a little bit about that, about how the thing that you love and brings you peace, if you do it too much or put too much emphasis on it, it can actually become something that becomes a little detrimental to your spiritual life. Have you ever dealt with that or seen that in any of your, you know, people that you work with? For sure. Yes. Because if I, if I think, you know, that I will not be okay until I get to this yoga class, you know, my life, I'm not going to have peace. You know, I need to get out of this chaos or, you know, I need to 
deal with these feelings I'm having or the stressful day. And I will be, I will be able to deal with that once I get to yoga. That is not really how God is calling us to live. He wants us to be in the moment. And so being present centered, which I'm so grateful, yoga is a present centered practice. You cannot practice yoga and have your mind somewhere else, or you're going to fall on your face when you're doing the poses. So it's very mindful. Um, but I've had to learn and I've had to remember that um, no matter what's going on in my life, I need to be okay with me. Um, again, so creativity can work against me because I can chase after people come to me all the time. I'm, you know, I know this happens with creatives. Once you get into a place where people see that you're doing good work and they see that, you know, you have contributions to make, you get asked to do things all the time. So it's really knowing what to say. I've had to learn to say no. No, I can't do that. Or no, that's really not going to be a part of the bigger purpose and plan. I think it's really looking at, you know, there's a bigger plan for me. And, you know, if I go off and chase this, that's going to deter from what the big plan is. And so it's being really conscious of the decisions I make and how I spend my time. Isn't it curious that success is actually can be the enemy of success that I, 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 there's a book I think I've read called Essentialism. And he talks about that, about how the more, like you just said, the more you get successful, the more you're asked to do, the less you end up doing of the things that you're supposed to do and the less that you focus on the right things. And I think it's so interesting that as a, as again, as a, as a writer and as a teacher, as a mentor, you have to practice those same things of discipline of saying no maybe even disappointing some people sometimes who feel like you have to give more. But uh, clearly what you've learned even in, in your instruction is uh, kind of like the put the mask on yourself first thing, uh, taking care of yourself first is not, uh, I kind of want to jump into this. I, I, I know I'm jumping a couple of topics here, but you know, as I said, my ADD kicks in and that it's actually a good thing sometimes and a very bad thing in the same way. Um, the idea of self-care Um I think, again, this is one of the same things where as creatives, I'm talking to creatives, we're teaching people, you got to take care of yourself. You got to say no, you have to have boundaries. But then is there a little bit of that side where it becomes selfish? And <laughs> is there times where like we to put too much emphasis on the self-care and the I need to take care of me? Do you, again, is that, I'm just asking your personal opinion as a practitioner and as someone who counsels people uh, biblically. Is that something we need to be careful of, the whole self-care movement? Yeah, so that's really, uh, I think that's a great question to, to talk about because, you know, I've always heard and, and I share a lot, a lot of times when I mentor because people are taught that self-care is selfish. Um, I believe it becomes selfish when it becomes, again, if we talk about idols, idols, anything that you want more than God. So if you are desiring and hoping and wanting, like, I just need this time to myself, I need to go on vacation. If that is your main focus and desire, then I think it's crossed over. Otherwise, I believe in every day carving out time to do something for yourself that gives back to you. Yesterday, it was as simple for me as sitting out in the sun for 10 minutes, just quiet, just letting the sun hit my face, my body, listening to the birds. I had my eyes closed. It can be as something simple as that. It may be that you make yourself or you go purchase yourself a really nice, healthy meal. Those little types of things are what put back. I call it the spiritual cup. And it's a, it's a, when I teach this meditation, it's like our heart is, you know, our heart is full when we're spiritually full or it's empty when we're depleted because we've been giving so much that we haven't actually taken the time to give back to ourselves. So I come from a family that believes self-care is selfish, but yet I see that my family has a lot of health problems or very hard workers, very hard workers, but they have a lot of health problems. Um, there's no balance in their life. The pendulum is swinging you know, to the right and to the left. Where do you want to live in that pendulum? We want it right in the center. We don't want to be swinging wildly from one side to the other. Oh, I love that. Because again, I think creatives and musicians and, and dancers and all of us, we do feel either we have to be all in, right? 110% working, 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 creating, creating, creating. And then we feel that loss when it's not happening. And uh, I, a book by uh, Darlene Shett called Emotional, I'm sorry, it's called uh, extravagant worship, but the, I took this phrase for my own book. She called, she talked about David and how she called it emotional fervor, how he seemed to swing from, I will bless the Lord to, I wish I had never been born. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he was a man after God's own heart, but he felt these swings, like you said, these pendulum swings. And that's exactly how she described it as both as creators and as Christians, we have to be careful that like the Bible says, in all things have moderation to just be mindful and understanding that you don't have to go from one side to the other, but that God can plant you firmly 
And uh, I call it, and for my thing, I've been saying these three phrases, blessed, abundant, and balanced. Mm-hmm. Um, I think creatives and musicians and artists in general, we, we have trouble, like you just said, just taking that time to be centered and focus. I wanted to kind of just make sure I, I, I brought this up because again, as a total it, un, un, uh, novice and knowing nothing about yoga, if somebody <laughs> like me, and I, I would love to get into this thing about whole, the whole men and yoga thing, I'm sure there's a whole another topic <laughs> we could talk about when it comes to the, 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 how, how the genders uh, handle yoga. But if someone did want to approach this for the first time, like someone like me or someone like maybe my daughter back was, how would they consider getting into this without uh, getting into trouble with some of the, uh, the, 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 the dangerous parts of the uh, practice uh, where, where, where they might get into something that doesn't meld with their faith? How could they step into it for the first time safely? That's a great question because I actually just uh, wrote an article called How to Practice Yoga and Not Compromise Your Faith. And my top three things that I talk about in that article, number one is, you know, you want to think about yourself when you're going into the yoga world as an investigator. It's an investigator for your faith. You do need to do a little bit of checking out and checking up. And so now with yoga so mainstream, that's really simple to hop on a website and just start to look at what the owner, you know, you can tell right away. Maybe even the name of the yoga studio would, would tell you, you know, if it has like a, maybe something that's a nod to a, a Buddhist tradition or a Buddhist name or a Hindu name. Um, you can see the pictures of the studio. If you see deities in there, maybe a, a Buddhist statue or something, these are all little clues that you can say that might not be a good fit for me. Places that are really safe to go are places like the gym. Usually in the gym, they're not allowed to discuss any type of religion in the gym. So the the physical part of the practice is what the emphasis is, which is what we want. We want the physical and the mental benefits, but we don't want the spiritual component if we're being protective of our Christian faith. So, um, you know, you can also have conversations, go, go and talk to the studio owners, ask the Uh, instructor who's leading the class, just simple questions like, you know, do you have any yogic philosophy that you infuse in your teachings? Yogic philosophy, again, you just have to be wise and discerning. Um, A lot of times when I was in it, I felt like so many times, Alan, I was in a battle on my yoga mat because the things being spoken over me, I knew were not true. And so I, I wrote this book and I wrote this article and things, and I speak of these things like I am to you because we don't want to go into a battleground. That's not what yoga is about. Yoga is a place for us to go and to do something good for our health, our mental and physical health. So we have to just be really careful about the spiritual component. That's where asking questions, checking up, being that spiritual investigator before you ever step foot. And of course, praying. Praying and asking God, God, is this a partnership? Because we want to be careful who we yoke ourselves to. And believe me, yoga is a very intimate practice in a lot of ways. Um, When I'm practicing and teaching with all my students, there's a connection there. And so, again, as the Bible says, do not yoke yourselves with unbelievers. Um, And so that's just an important part to consider as well. Wow. And that's such a deep concept there. Because, again, speaking to me, and I immediately go to my musician friends, same thing happens on the stage. The same thing happens when you're performing. I mean, you know, in a, any worship atmosphere, but not forget worship, a concert, everybody in the room is feeling and there is a spiritual component to music. And we all know, you know, these, these phrases and things, again, I don't want to get too super spiritual, but there is definitely a frequency, right? There's a frequency and a oneness that comes with any kind of music when people are expressing themselves and the feeling you get. And that's why musicians and creatives that are in these worlds feel that tug because at the time, they may be on a stage performing or singing something that is putting out something that is not of God and not of their spirit, but they have to protect their heart. I think you said that in something else, and you basically alluded to it, being an investigator, protecting your heart, being aware of your surroundings. Because maybe in the, um, the professional sense, I can't always say I have to divorce myself, I have to leave this studio, I have to leave this place, but I always can be aware of what's going on on the inside. And I think you're obviously saying that for anybody practicing this, that you have to be aware of what's in the inside and protecting that at all times. Yes. So, you know, as I I talk about my book, as I escalated in the world of yoga, where I was, um, you know, seeking the highest level of training, I had to, you know, go through these trainings. And I was very wise and discerning my faith at this time. But I always would pray before and say, God, please show me what is untruth in this show me if this is a practice I could continue you know obviously I did it to get my certification 
but he did that every time I partnered with him on the mat. And so every time he would reveal to me something that was not of him, something that was untrue. And, um, you know, I, I felt very grateful and thankful that I had that protection, but it made me very concerned as a sister as a Christ to other believers, you know, what's happening to other people around the world that don't really have that kind of wisdom in the sermon or that maybe are just unaware yeah, and so that's so amazing that you did, again, step into this world. I read it on your Amazon bio in the book that this was the only book of its kind. And uh, again, talking author to author, I felt the same way when I wrote God and Gigs. It was, I just said, this is something most of us should be dealing with. I mean, Christians all over the world are playing music in all over, in every, in every genre. We shouldn't be divorced from the world. As you said, we should be, you know, I think the same thing in your bio. We should be in the, in, in, in the Bible, obviously, in the world, but not of the world. And so we should be doing all this work and helping people with physical health, mental health, um, um, everything that comes with our, our ability, right? Our characteristics and our, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Our skills. God gave you specific skills as a dancer, as a choreographer, as a, now as a yoga instructor to get to the highest level. And people need you in that space as to be a witness. Like we shouldn't be afraid. I think that's the key word I'm trying to say now. I don't think we should be afraid to step into those areas. Uh, we're needed, but we just have to be aware of what, of our surroundings and how we can be a light in, the, in in darkness. And so, I really appreciate you so much for just bringing so much light and revelation. Again, just something I would never realized years ago that I would be able to uh, to equate to music. But now it's like, oh my gosh, you and I are <laughs> both in the same space. We're trying to help people to navigate this world without sacrificing their faith, without losing what's inside. Can you tell us, by the way, I know this, this is still old school. Some people still write stuff down. <laughs> so how can they find your book? How can they find you online? You have so many programs. I, I just want you to list them all because I feel like a lot of people listening have had their eyes open and they're going to want to find out more about you. Oh, I'd love that. Um, well, welcome anyone who's out there. I would love to hear from me or talk to you. And you can find me at MirandaJoeDavis.com. Uh, there's a, all my offerings on there from the classes that I offer virtually. I teach, still teach yoga and Pilates every week. Um, have a great following there and would love to have you. Uh, you can also, um, I am launching a teacher training. It's, this is a one of first of its kind, a Christian yoga teacher training launching in January of 2021. This is for traditionally trained yoga instructors like myself who want to make their certification work for them but want to disregard and, and let go of the philosophical teachings, I'm going to teach you how to teach Christian yoga. So I am very excited about that. Um, you can find me also on Instagram, Miranda Jo Davis, and just say hello, shout, give me a little shout out. Well, I'm sure people are going to do that again. This has been such a, I mean, we got so many things out of this conversation. Again, I'm so glad we stuck with it, <laughs> stuck through all the technical difficulties. And again, I'm really looking forward to learning more about you and everything that you're sharing. Uh, the physical health, again, I'm kind of like just putting a little tag on the end. That's something, again, as a man and as a uh, believer, I do believe sometimes we neglect that part uh, of our lives. And especially, again, creatives, we get on the hustle train. And we forget that we have to take care of ourselves first. So I'm definitely going to be investigating more. I don't know if I'm going to get in the yoga mat with my daughter. I don't know if I'm ready for that. <laughs> she's <laughs> she's told me many times that I need to do it. So I'm going to work my way, but I'm going to follow your teachings. I'm going to read your book. And uh, you, who knows, you may find me <laughs> next to my daughter on the mat. And I'm going to probably feel much better about that. So Miranda, thank you so much for sharing so much wisdom and insight. And it's been a blessing to talk with you today. Thank you. I feel the same way. Blessed to have listened and shared and talked and had a great conversation with you, Alan. And thank you for everyone for just being here. I'm so grateful. Well, my friend, I can't tell you how much I enjoyed that interview and how much it opened up new doors for me to really see the benefits of meditation, of mindfulness, of being connected to my creator in all ways that I can do so, which include my physical body, the way that I move, the way that I think, all are related. And Miranda shows how that is related in your life as well. So I hope you've taken from this, from a fellow creative, from someone that's had to work between those two worlds of a secular world and a sacred world, both of which seem to not quite understand what she was doing. I hope you took from that, that you also have a calling that you can apply to all walks of life, to anyone that needs to find you 
in what you do, there's probably a way that God is calling you to do it that may not be the same as everyone else. But you've got to pursue it and you've got to continue to walk out your faith, even in places where it's not the quote unquote traditional way of doing things. So thank you again, Miranda, for spending time with me. I hope you'll follow everything she does. Go check out her show notes and just go to MirandaJoDavis.com and you can find out more about her, her book, her writings, and everything else she is up to. And would you do me one more favor? If you know a creative who might need this kind of encouragement, who could be struggling or feeling alone or feeling like no one understands them, this might be just the episode that they need to hear to know that they're not alone and there are ways that they can connect the dots between their creative life and their spiritual life. So I would ask you, please think of that one person right now, send it to them, send them a text, put it in your uh, WhatsApp or your Twitter or your Facebook post and just let them know that there's a place where creatives are connecting with their faith, with their Christian identity, but also walking it out in the arts and entertainment industry no matter where that is, and we can be a light in darkness and help each other to help other people, okay? So guys, until next time, keep on doing everything you can to become the creative that you were created to be. God bless you, take care, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for joining us here at the God and Gig Show. Please leave us a review on iTunes, like our Facebook page, Or visit GodOnGigs.com and tell us what you thought of this show. We'll be back soon. In the meantime, go create something amazing.